There are, I think, lots of implications for social scientists now in this kind of new data era um, in terms of the sorts of skills that you need to equip yourselves with um, and the, the, you know, the, the increasing need to work interdisciplinarily. Um, I mean, when I, uh, when I finished my PhD many, many, many years ago, um, the kind of the, the, the main way of approaching your career was to start out and you know, try and publish a single authored paper, uh, maybe using survey data or focus groups and so on. I mean, there's still, you know, there's still a lot of mileage in doing that, but I think there are many, many more options open to people. Um, and hopefully what we'll see is some of, you know, some of the, the challenges and the opportunities uh, that are offered now in this new context. So what is, is this new context? Um, well, there's yeah, essentially. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of play on my, um, my my sort of longevity a bit here, um, and, and contrast what the situation was when I was kind of finishing my PhD to, to and sort of sorts of data that were available then, um, to what what's available now. Um, now I remember uh, one of, one of my memories is that um, when I used to work on um, survey data, British Household Panel Survey. Um, and at that time when I was doing my PhD, it was great that you could, you could send off an email um, and someone at Essex University would send you a few weeks later a CD uh, with the data set on it. And I remember thinking, this is, this is amazing, you know, we, we can, we can, this has opened up all these avenues. But I mean, that was only, you know, 20 years ago and now the landscape has completely changed. So we've got, of course, social media data, um, Twitter. Uh, Facebook, all sorts of other things that people are now using, um, both as, as we'll see in the in the uh, in those sessions, both as ways of, of 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 obtaining data that might shed light on kind of conventional questions that as social scientists we're interested in, you know, what are the dynamics of public opinion, who are people going to vote for in the election, and so on but also as, 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 as sites of interest in their own right. These are actually now where people communicate, interact and so on. So this is important not just to use these as, as a new form of data, but of, of, of sites of scientific interest in themselves. Um, online surveys is what I'll be talking about this and you'll be hearing more about uh, online surveys, but another huge development um, you know, the vast majority of, of surveys now being completed online um, and that has um, a lot of implications for uh, the, the ways in which we can survey people and the kinds of data that we can obtain, the quality of the data, the cost of the data and so on. But another, a, a really huge change um, in, um, in the data landscape. Um, admin data um, I think is, is something that has been uh, around for a while, offering a lot of promise. Um, you know, I think it get probably going back five, ten years, Mike, there was a big push for saying we've got all this data out there. Uh, well, not all of it, but we've got a lot of data on people. Um, why do we need to keep going and doing surveys, asking questions about how much people earn and so on when we know this from their tax returns? Um, and if we can link things up in a smart way, we, we've got this you know, really excellent data infrastructure that we can use. And in, in many countries, particularly in Scandinavia, this kind of data infrastructure is already uh, well established. Um, but there, perhaps we've made less progress in terms of being able to access that data uh, than, than we might like. But nonetheless, that's, I think, a really um, big new thing that admin data has been uh, around for a while, but uh, there's, there's certainly um, you know, more emphasis and I think more availability despite some of the, uh, uh, the access problems. Um, cutting across all of this is the, um, the, the way that we access this information, mobile digital devices. Um, again, you know, my first mobile phone, I think I got in the year 2000, was one of those Nokia black, Nokia brick things, basically. Battery never ran out because you never really wanted to do anything with it other than take a phone call. Um, of course, that's again, you know, enormously changed and the, the sorts of things that, that you can do 
with your smartphone connecting to the internet and is, is obviously key to that but once you're connected there's all sorts of things uh, that one can now do in, including of course um, completing online surveys, accessing your social media, um, using GPS and so on. Um, and that's something which is transformative in another way which is that again you know there's a big uh, age gradient in, in the way that people are using these devices. Um, you know, I have kids who are 15 and, and 11 um, and they use their, their mobile devices in completely different ways to me really, I, ways that I would never think of you know, reading stuff and watching films and so on. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a, an interesting angle which I'll come back to here which is a, a, you know, a potential kind of promising uh, angle to our social scientists uh, in the, the, the ability to, to actually access people and collect data from people who are much more comfortable with using these devices than, than, than someone of my vintage or older. Um, another big uh, development is the, the uh, availability of what I'll broadly call textual, textual archives, um, digitized um, text databases of all various kinds that because they're online and because they're digitized they are uh, not always but large in principle they are accessible as data uh, sources and we can apply various kind of machine learning natural language um, programming and so on to mine into this and to uh, to do both quantitative and qualitative uh, data analysis and Another kind of, I mean, th these are, you can see there's a lot of cross cutting. They, these are not sharp boundaries between these, these various uh, dimensions here. But what we can broadly call transactional data, um, data that sort of arises um, as a kind of, you know, a, a, an epiphenomenon, the, the exhaust fumes of the way that we uh, go about conducting our, our digital lives these days. So, you know, we take taxi rides with, with Uber. And it's actually interesting, I, I was uh, putting these slides together yesterday and I saw something on uh, Twitter, so there's probably a trail of me uh, doing this, if someone could ac access it, uh, my, my thought patterns, um, and someone tweeted a thing saying, if you really want to know what you're like as a person and what people think of you in business and, and in your organisation, um, get, get your phone up and look at your Uber account, see what your Uber rating is from the drivers. Okay. Um, and there was then an interesting sort of discussion about this, which essentially said that, you know, if you've got a low rating, which I think is something like an eight point, no, a 4.5 out of five, I think is, is a low rating. Then this, this suggests that you're probably the sort of person who gets in an Uber, doesn't say hello, gets straight on their mobile phone, talks to people and doesn't give a tip. Um, now, uh, I looked at mine, I got a 4.82, so I'm doing okay, I'm not doing too badly. But, but you can see there that there's, that's a something which is completely new, and if we can access that data, it does give us something interesting, some, something potentially insightful about the way that people behave, the way that they interact with others, and the way that people uh, sort of perceive those, those behaviours and so on. Um, and obviously bike shares, um, these are uh, connected, so you can see, you can get these, you know, the, 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 the quite neat looking maps of where the, um, the Boris bikes or whatever, they're all over the, the, the world these days, aren't they? You know, where people are going, kind of what sorts of uh, rides people are taking, um, what the uh, effect of various bike schemes are on real estate prices. These can all be kind of linked up. Um, and so on, offering new possibilities. Airbnb and all of these are kind of, uh, I was at a meeting um, last week talking about um, you know, new ways of investigating trust between people, social trust and so on. And someone raised a really interesting point about Airbnb and how, and, and similar things where you get ratings, you know, that you, you, how do you, if someone's only got one rating, do you, or no ratings, do you, how do you trust that person? How do you build up trust and the importance of these kinds of uh, reviews and so on in, in modern life? And you know, again, all of these have barriers to access. Some are, are proprietary data. And one of the big things that we know and we'll hear about um, in social media analysis is that you know, 
the, if it's Twitter data, um, you know, you can't necessarily access it, archive it. If you, if you, what you access may change if people are able to delete their tweets and so on. So there's, there's all sorts of, of you know, difficult issues, but there's all sorts of uh, opportunities uh, that um, present themselves for social scientists. Although, one of the things that I will want to, to pose as a challenge, and we can perhaps come back to this in the discussion, is whether all of this, whether there's a sort of, you know, a bit of a hype underlying a lot of this, you know, particularly on the kind of the big data front. Is this something that, that really is so exciting for social science? I mean, it's certainly exciting, certainly useful in all sorts of ways for, for you know, logistics and uh, uh, there's, there's huge benefits to be had from it, undoubtedly, but is there a real social science payoff? Well, well that's an, an interesting question. So, as I said, the, the focus of, of my talk and, and of this afternoon is about actually what's the implications of this in particular for uh, survey research. Um, and I thought I'd use as a, as a hook for this a, a paper that some of you may be familiar with, others, others not. Uh, this is a paper by um, Mike Savage and Roger Burrows that they wrote in 2007. It's in sociology, it's open access, so you can easily get hold of it. Um, and it's quite a sort of provocative think piece. Um, it's published in 2007, so it's kind of even before the term big data had any real currency. Um, but that's really what they're talking about. Um, and they're talking about, they're looking forward and, and thinking, what are the implications of this data revolution, the sorts of things I've just been talking about there, for academic social scientists. They talk particularly about sociologists because they're, they're sociologists themselves, but I think there are um, uh, wider implications. So, here they say, uh, and I should, I should add, they're, they're not just sort of qualitative people having a go at, at, at surveys. Uh, Mike Savage uses surveys quite a lot himself. They also have a go at, at uh, you know, uh, qualitative interviews and so on. So they're, they're, they're equally nasty to everyone. Um, but so they say the sample survey is not a tool that stands outside history. Its glory years, uh, we contend, are in the past. So this is a, you know, a red, you know, red flag for someone like me, who's uh, you know, steeped in, in, in all my career spent doing surveys. And here's something even more provocative. It's unlikely we suggest that in the future, the sample survey will be a particularly important research tool. And those sociologists or social scientists who stake their expertise of their discipline to this method might want to reflect on whether this might leave them exposed to marginalisation or even redundancy. So this is pretty scary stuff. And there's me back in 2007 thinking, blimey, maybe I'll be out of a job. Um, maybe I should jump on this kind of, you know, uh, big data, uh, transactional data uh, bandwagon. So this, you know, I think deliberately provocative, but some interesting ideas, not just saying that surveys are kind of old fashioned, but, but making the point that a lot of the new forms of data are not sort of held within universities. As we saw, these are often kind of uh, proprietary, owned by corporations, uh, owned by government and so on. And that where a lot of the interesting developments are actually taking place are not in sociology departments or statistics departments, but in Google or Facebook. And that's where a lot of the smart data scientists and so on uh, are locating themselves. So, in some ways, that's the, I guess, the, the hook of what I'm going to be presenting for the rest of my talk, is trying to sort of say, well, do, do, do I believe this? Is, 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 are we in danger of um, uh, finding ourselves redundant if we stick with the survey method? Um, I'll give you a spoiler. I think the answer to that is, is no. OK, so um, I'm going to talk on, uh, about a few things. Um, but I'm mainly going to talk about a piece of work that I've been uh, doing with uh, um, Rebecca Luff, who's a research fellow at NCRM. It's, it's one of our NCRM uh, research projects. Um, and we're, what we're trying to do is to understand how our patterns of data usage, how have patterns of data usage been changing over time, what kinds of data 
uh, are social scientists using now um, and so on. So what, what, what kinds of data are we using? How does this vary over disciplines? How's it changed over time? In particular, to address the Savage and Burroughs question, are we witnessing a decline in the use of surveys and a concomitant increase in the sort of nebulous term uh, big data? Um, a, a parenthetic, although I think important uh, question is, um, how well are people reporting their, their survey methods? If they're using uh, surveys, are they re reporting response rates, modes of interview, sample size, and so on? Um, so that's, a, I say, a sort of a parenthetic, but nonetheless um, important concern. So um, survey research, are, sur are we really in kind of crisis mode? Do we need to be uh, thinking about uh, getting new jobs? Well, it, it's not just the fact that um, there's all this new data out there. Surveys have their own particular set of problems that we uh, need to deal with. So the, the big one that um, has been around for some time now and causes people a lot of headaches is the response rate issue. So um, again, when I started in survey research, my first job was with the Office for Population Censuses and Surveys, now the Office for National Statistics. Back then, it was fairly standard to get a response rate for a face-to-face -face survey of 70% or above. That was the kind of, you know, the, the standard that you would expect to get and, and a minimum standard as well. Um, over the ensuing sort of 25 years, response rates have gone down and down. Um, so now I'd say, you know, depending on the design and the topic of the survey and so on, um, but you would, you'd struggle to reach uh, 50% response rate, even for a sort of relatively interesting topic. Um, it's even worse for other modes of, of interview. Um, we don't tend to do phone surveys so much in, in this country, certainly not random digit dialing, that's what RDD stands for, they're ran random phone surveys, we don't do them. But in the US, even for sort of high quality uh, government or academic surveys, it's, it's routine to get below 10% response rates, and these are uh, going down. Um, this is, you know, we, we're getting more kind of problematic legislation, do not dial numbers and, and this kind of stuff, various data protection laws coming in, which are making that, that even harder. So as this is all, all happening, um, you know, people who commission surveys there's the sorts of surveys that, that would you know, previously get the 70% response rates, are saying, you know, what are we getting for all these hundreds of thousands of pounds that we're spending on this, particularly when we're hearing all this stuff about we can get this for free from Google and, 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 and admin data. What's, what's the payoff? Um, and as, as our response rates get edged down towards this kind of 10%, what's the benefit relative to having a, a good quota sample, something which doesn't have a response rate at all, something which doesn't use random probability sampling. Okay? So taking us into a, 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 you know, a different and uh, cheaper form of... Uh, ah, that's a strange one, sorry. Oh, it's because it's doing this reveal thing. I'll put it all there. So that's the, the context of of response rates. Response rates getting worse. Um, at the same time, the costs of doing these kinds of high quality surveys uh, is, is increasing. Um, and that's, you know, also, it's also worth bearing in mind that we're spending more money as the response rates are going down. So if we were kind of, you know, keeping our costs flat, then the, the, the response rates would be uh, even worse. I went to a presentation by uh, Simon Jackman, who at the time was running the American National Election Study uh, in, in the US, a long-standing, the kind of gold standard election study uh, in America going back to the, to the 50s. Um, and his estimate was that it cost, and this is public money, $2,000 per complete interview for the 2012 American National Election Study. So when you look at your your, you know, your data, data set of the ANES, each one of those people cost $2,000 after you've factored in all the... Now, I think he deliberately made that number as big as he possibly could. <laughs> I can see Joel not shaking his head. 
what does that include? It does include two waves of data collection, face to face. So that's a bit of a, 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 an overestimate. But in the, in the US, face to face interviewing is enormously expensive, much more than it is here, because if you draw a sample point in Wyoming, you have to fly an interviewer there and put them up in a hotel, rent a car and, and, and so on for, for a month. So it's, it's very more expensive here. Um, here's, here's my ballpark estimate for what an equivalent sort of number for a row in a data set might be in, in the UK. Um, so if you just wanted to go and commission something from Curtis or, or Joel uh, at, at, at Natsen or, or Kantar and said, I want to uh, 50% response rate, about 1,500 uh, re respondents, 45-minute interview using CAPI, um, draw drawn using the standard approach, a PATH sample. I think that would cost you 150, 200 pounds, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. We can have a discussion about that. That would be, if you can do it cheaper than that, we maybe can have a, have a chat. Um, so very expensive and in some ways getting worse in terms of quality, it, certainly in terms of the, the kinds of quality indicators that we, uh, that we use. And again, there's this point about, you know, the sponsors saying, what do we get for this? If you compare that, if you went to YouGov and said, you know, how much is this going to cost me for, uh, a, a, you know, just an opt-in online panel, probably about five pounds per respondent maybe a bit less. And there's certainly cheaper operators than the new gov out there. So you really want to know what you're getting uh, uh, it, it, in, in terms of uh, additionality there. What's driving this? What's driving the increase in costs? Well, we, you know, it's the response rates. Um, why are the response rates going down? Well, that's a big question. We're not uh, entirely sure about that. It's societal changes. It's, it's you know, more atomized lives that we lead. It's the increasing number of requests that we get to do. Every time you get on an airplane or borrow a book from whatever, you get a, a text saying, can you do our, our survey uh, and so on. So there are lots and lots of different factors coming together, but they are making, making people harder to persuade to do a survey. So we, we, we send interviewers back more freak to do more and more calls. Each time they call back, that has a cost to it. So the, 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 uh, that's driving up costs. We also do refusal conversions. If someone says, no, I'm too busy now, don't want to do it, we'll send another interviewer back another time. Again, very expensive. That's often a, maybe a, a more senior, more experienced interviewer who gets sent back. Um, similarly, we're, we're offering more incentives than we used to do in the past. For the, the Understanding Society survey, um, this is actually in a kind of experimental part of the, of the study, uh, found that they had to offer £30 incentives to get people to complete online at the same rate as they had done face to face. So, you know, if we, where we can make some savings in terms of not using interviewers, that's largely burned up by having to offer people uh, larger incentives. So uh, essentially a lot of the, 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 these total costs that we're burning are coming from trying to get the, the, our response rates up to a sort of reasonable 50%, you know, really working the sample to, to, to get a, a reasonable uh, threshold response rate to get those hard to get ones. And that's after all kind of the, the, the logic of what we're doing with surveys, right? We, if, we, if we just do a... Um, a quota sample, we don't get these hard to get ones. That's what we think is the kind of the benefit. So, you know, that, that, that makes sense, but it's where the, the cost really uh, ratchets up. Here you can see, this is a bit dated, this, um, this graph, but it shows you the, the basic point. Um, it's using the, uh, it's from this paper by Curtin et al in Public Opinion Quarterly 2000, um, and it, sh it, it uses a consistent survey, has the same methodology, and you can see that the, the number of contact attempts is, is increasing year on year and, and the percentage of refusals while the response rate is kind of going down from 70 to 68. And you could you know, pick any number of surveys would show the same, uh, sh same trends. More effort, um, more cost, response rate staying flat or, or going down. 
So, so this is bad from a kind of a cost and a quality perspective. Um, we've also got a few other things that we want to worry about when we're, when we're sort of really squeezing people to do our, our research for us, um, is that we may get persuade people, may give them 30 quid to do the survey, but they'll give us bad data. You know, they'll just straight line through the questionnaire, not give it any thought. We're changing the, the nature of the social exchange from one where we say, this is a worthy thing that we're doing. We're doing research. Can you give your time and, and that will benefit other people to saying, this is a, a financial exchange. We'll give you 30 quid. You spend as little of your time as possible. So we, we perhaps encourage that. Um, we, we're, we're similarly place, placing implicit pressure on respondents, therefore, there's the same point in many ways, to, to fabricate, to, to, to just do the questionnaires in order to get the money. If you're doing that, then you don't want to think about the, uh, the responses that you're giving. Same kind of pressure on interviewers. Um, there is, there's evidence that in a lot of the sort of high quality uh, comparative and, uh, surveys that the interviewers are just sitting on the curb and making up data um, so that they get paid. Um, and is it, you know, there's, a, there's an ethical boundary that we can cross when people don't want to, to do our studies. You know, ultimately, we, we have to get to the point where we say, OK. Um, and sometimes that, that, that boundary um, can be potentially uh, crossed. So there are certainly um, a lot of pressures on survey research as the kind of premier method of, of the social sciences. So we might expect, as this combines with this new uh, data landscape, to see the Savage and Burroughs uh, forecast, if you like, coming uh, to fruition. So that's what we were, what, well, not entirely, but a large driver of what we're interested in in this piece of work, which I said is joint with uh, Dr. Rebecca Luff. Um, I should also say that um, this is a work in progress. So these are sort of provisional numbers uh, we're just kind of working through. There are, there are a few things, in fact, these are the, the first time I've seen these numbers was on the weekend. And so I've spent the last couple of days kind of saying, that looks a bit odd, Rebecca. W why is that? And, and she, so we've bought, there may be a few things that you think look odd here. And I'm interested in, in your thoughts on, on, on this work. So what we're doing is uh, trying to answer this question about how, is, how are patterns of uh, social science data usage changing over time? And how do they vary across discipline? So, how would you, well, there are different ways one could skin that cat. How would you approach that, that question? Um, one way of doing that is to take a sample of journal articles and look at what the data that's being used in, in those published articles is. Um, so that's what we did. There are other ways of doing it, and this certainly has its, its limitations particularly in the way that we've implemented it, and we're, we're well aware of those. Some of these are you know, quite interesting issues, I think. But what we did was, that, so we weren't the first people to do this. There's a paper by Stanley Presser, I think in Public Opinion Quarterly in 1983, uh, and a follow-up paper by uh, Saris and Galhofer uh, in, uh, I'll, I'll give you the citations for these, but that's in a, a book chapter, I think, in their book uh, of 2007. Um, so what Presser, Stan Presser did was to take these journals, which are the sort of the main, the premier journals in, in, in each discipline in 1983, um, and take all the articles in each of them and code them for what the data they were using. He was he's a particularly interested in whether people were using surveys, not so much in, in other forms of data. So that was his primary concern. So he looked at these years, 4950, 64, 65, 7980, um, and Saris and Galhofer updated this in 94, 95. Um, so we thought, well, it'd be quite interesting now to look at this, uh, add, take this up to 2015. So we looked at 2014, 2015. And I'll show you the results of, of what we found uh, in a moment. Um, I said there are different ways one could approach answering this question. Another way is to do a survey um, of social scientists, right, and say what kind of data do you use? Uh, and indeed, uh, there's a, 
a paper by Katie Metzler and Nick Allen and others published last year. You can find this on the on the internet. Um, what they do is they have a very large database of social scientists who are uh, contacts of Sage in one form or another. It's not exactly clear who, where, what this sample frame is. People who've written for Sage or signed up in, in some way. Um, so they sent out this this uh, online questionnaire invite. They got nine and a half thousand people nearly social scientists to fill in the questionnaire which is an impressively large number of people um, problem is the response rate is less than two percent okay so whether this is representative whether whether this the sample frame in the first place was representative of the population of social scientists and then the, the response rate but what they find their headline finding is that 33 a third of people third of social scientists report having undertaken big data research. Now that strikes me as an, a surprisingly high proportion uh, and a, a, I would say an unfeasibly high proportion. I think part of the reason is to do with this. If you get an invitation to an online survey which is about you know doing big data, if you do big data you're probably more likely to click on it and, and do it. That's one thing. Also, I mean, we're all aware that, that big data is a rather nebulous, unfortunate term. We kind of sort of think we know what it is, but once you drill down in it, it's, it's slippery. And so people were essentially relying on uh, their own definition of uh, what constitutes having done big data research. But that's another uh, perspective on this and another way uh, that one could try and answer this question. We think certainly there are there are flaws in our approach and we wouldn't want to claim that the percentages that I'm going to show you in a moment would in any way be the correct unbiased population uh, estimate. So if we first look at um, the findings of that you know have already published from the the Stan Presser and Saris and Galhofer papers um, you can see here that this, so this is the percentage using surveys, okay? And, and the, the numbers in parentheses is the, is the actual number of, of journal articles on which this is based. So you can see two things, I guess. Uh, one is that surveys make up a pretty substantial minority overall, but a, sub a substantial amount of the data that social scientists were using in this kind of post-war period. Um, there's a, a trend towards increasing use of surveys. And I think you know, that, that, that reflects the fact that we would you know, start doing more surveys, uh, increasing skills, access to the data, increasing and so on. But certainly, so uh, a, a sort of general trend towards uh, increasing uh, survey research. And across disciplines, the, the <coughs> percentages vary quite a lot. As you'd expect, public opinion research almost entirely based on, on surveys. Um, less so in, in political science, certainly in the, in the early days. Political science as a discipline has, I think, changed quite a lot uh, over that period. If we update this now to 94-95 uh, in Saris and Galhofer, we see that the trend kind of increases so that in sociology, 70% of papers uh, now are uh, using surveys in sociology, increasing in, in political science, um, economics. So, you know, a good high proportion across all disciplines, although some variability. So in the pre-big data era, um, we're seeing this uh, increasing trend uh, towards uh, survey research. This fi final column here is, is, is like the, the, a big caveat point, which is that Stan Presser's study doesn't go, give a lot of detail about his methods, how he, how he defined things, what, how he did things. Um, and some of his definitions are a bit odd of what counts as a survey. So anything that was done by, any, any, anything that was done by the Census Bureau, for example, would count as a survey. Even if on closer examination there was no survey involved, he would just count anything that the Survey Bureau, Census Bureau did as a now. They came up, Saris and Galhofer came up with their own you know, definition of what constitutes a survey uh, in, in one of these articles. And you can see that the rates are still high and, and similar for uh, public opinion. But for some of them, 
it makes quite a big difference. So that tells you something about the way you do this kind of study, is that your definitions, unsurprisingly, make quite a lot of difference to uh, the, w what you uh, find in terms of the patterns. Okay, so this, another point to make about this, this is the percentage of all papers. So this includes papers that don't have any empirical content at all, theory papers and so on. So we updated this analysis. Uh, I say we, um, this was actually a team of coders that, that, that read all these papers. So we hired a team of coders. Um, we got uh, 1,450, uh, 1,453 papers across all those journals for those two years. Um, hired seven coders, trained them up, randomly assigned uh, papers to coders, um, and came up with a set of codes uh, that we asked them to apply to each paper that they read. First of all, whether it was a theory paper, a review paper, so no data. Then if, it was, if there was data, whether it was quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods, then various other things. I'm not going to report on all of these. We're only part of the way through the analysis. But which kind of data was used, survey data, big data, uh, and, and, and so on. So, let's say we're, we're making our way through this. Um, and we found, you know, at the moment we've got, uh, we found that 8%, in terms of the sort of the reliability of the coding, 8% of the papers were flagged by one, at least one of the coders to say, there's something ambiguous here I'm not too sure about. Um, there's quite a lot of variability about, uh, in, in terms of which papers were flagged. So this tells us something, you know, about uh, how difficult this task was. We did a little coder reliability study where we got this, the, the same each coder to code the same subset of papers so we can get a, a better estimate of. So we've got pretty good rates of agreement here. 87 is the average pairwise agreement across all codes. That is a bit of variability across coders in that and particularly across um, the types of data. So that ranges from for the qualitative codes, very high levels of agreement, lower levels, although still reasonably high levels of agreement for uh, survey and, and administrative data. Okay, sorry, that's my, my slide's not quite fitting on there. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is the breakdown of uh, empirical and non-empirical papers. Um, so uh, about 14% of papers didn't have any empirical content at all. Um, this varies, again, a fair bit across disciplines, mostly in economics. This is the 2014-15. Kind of expect that. There's a lot of formal theory in, in economics um, and uh, you know, macro uh, economics and so on it doesn't really uh, involve much in the way of, of data. Um, but what we're focusing on uh, for the rest of these slides is this column here, this 1,251, that did have some uh, empirical component to them. Um, quali quantitative, qualitative and mixed, the vast majority of papers are um, quantitative in, in these uh, journals. Okay? Again, varies in ways that we might expect. Virtually no qualitative papers in economics um, and rather a large number of qualitative, a large proportion, 11%, still quite, quite a low percentage um, of uh, qualitative papers in sociology, but you know, still quite high in both social psychology um, and uh, sociology mixed methods, particularly in, in social psychology. But vast majority of papers uh, in, uh, use quantitative methods, if we break that down a little bit and say what kinds of, uh, of, of quantitative data uh, are being used, then 48% uh, using surveys, 47%, these, sorry, I sh sh should point out that these don't sum to 100 because you can use more than one kind of data in, 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 in a paper. Um, so actually quite high rates of, uh, of admin data, uh, not much in the way of, you know, overtly big data, but this is from a base of you know, zero from uh, 94, 95. So we're certainly seeing evidence of um, 
the emergence of big data, particularly if we're kind of expanding that to include you know, some forms of admin data. It depends on what our, our definition is here um, uh, of big data. We've certainly, and, and no real decline in, in survey uh, data. In terms of uh, mainly qualitative data, these are pretty small uh, percentages here, um, but mainly using uh, interview focus group or kind of observational study. Um, quite a lot of you know uh, text analysis um, and uh, surprisingly high number of uh, visual methods papers in uh, uh, in in social psychology. But here we see the kind of the sort of qualitative big data, some evidence, but um, less than on the the quantitative side. So the direct comparison, we can't compare all of those backwards because essentially we've you know we've come up with new codes. In, in our data set which we can't which aren't published in the previous studies. For the ones that we can make a comparison, here we're looking at the, the proportion of empirical papers that use surveys across disciplines. Um, the red line is is the 2014-15 and the blue is 94-95. So you can see not much change really. Um, there's there's some uh, decline economics, sociology, a small drop off um, an increase in political science, quite a big increase in, in social psychology. So broadly, I'd say on average, staying stable, but with a bit of variability across disciplines. Where there is more of a change, I think this is interesting, is in, the, is in experimentation, where uh, across the board we're seeing a, a big increase in experiments. Um, social psychology, 46 up to 72, public opinion. I, my theory here is that that what we're seeing is partly the fact that it's very easy to load experiments into surveys, particularly into online surveys. There's been a kind of quite an explosion. And so I think what we'll see is once we put, put the, the, these parts of this together, that there's a lot of papers that are doing surveys and experiments. But that's the, the biggest sort of clear shift over this period is a big increase in experimentation. Probably also, I think, reflects the greater focus on causal inference that we've seen uh, over this period, the need to be able to demonstrate causal effects rather than just saying, you know, we're, we're not interested in causality. Um, yes? Yes, yeah. So if they mentioned doing an experiment and doing a survey, they would get ticked in each of those, th those categories. So we'll be able to sort of combine these eventually, but at the moment we've just got the sort of, you know, the univariate versions at the moment. Um, observation, this is kind of, you know, doing participant observation. Uh, that w what we see here is, you know, uh, a big decline in political science. So we, this is something that we want to go and kind of truth check this, any of these really big ones, but that kind of rings true a bit. Qu political science has become a lot more quantitative uh, over this period um, and uh, so we, we kind of expect, but you know, you see some increase of small increases, social psychology, sociology, um, zero in public opinion. Okay, that, that, that doesn't surprise me either. Um, Text analysis is another one where we see quite a big increase. As I said, I think that, that, that sort of accords with my intuition. We're seeing a lot more text analysis where there's a lot more availability of textual archives uh, and so on, although a, one uh, small drop off in um, uh, text analysis. In terms of the transparency and quality of the reporting of surveys, unfortunately we haven't seen much of an improvement. Um, a lot of pre presses, and that was what a lot of what he was doing in his original paper was kind of saying, you know, what's the, the quality of reporting like? Um, basic reporting is often absent. Um, there's uh, a lack of detail about uh, uh, response rates and so on. Um, a third of papers lack something really basic like the sampling method or the mode of interview. Um, and a new thing that's emerged since uh, presser's day um, is a lot of journals now 
refer you to all sorts of online appendices where all this information is available. Um, that's fine, there's, but there's a question about quite how much people are actually able to access or are indeed accessing that, that information. It's there, um, but not as part of the, the paper. So the, the story on transparency and quality of reporting um, is not um, great. What we, what we, where we want to take this next is to carry on doing uh, our analysis, uh, looking at the, the, the sort of combining of methods and so on, checking some of the strange uh, the, or the, the, the surprising results. Um, it, more ambitiously, what we want to do is to use this as a training data set um, because we're, we're not very happy with the sampling, if you like, of journals. If we, if we were doing this study from scratch, I wouldn't have started with that sample of journals in that time frame. I would have you know, designed, you know, defined my population, drawn a, 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 a stratified random sample of all, uh, uh, stratified across journals and so on. Um, and, and that's what we'd like to do. That may be feasible, uh, it may not. We can come back to this, hopefully I'll finish in time for some questions. Um, but one of the obvious limitations of our approach is that we're sticking with the same journals over time. Now, there's been an enormous expansion in the number of journals over this same period, and it, one would expect, I think, that you know, new kinds of science, new kinds of data, innovation, probably happens in more kind of niche types of journals. You know, the, the journal of so big data in social science or something doesn't find its way into the American Journal of Political Science until these are more established. So I think the nature of the, the, the set of journals, which are the, the premier journals in, in each discipline, probably mitigates against, militates against um, finding these new kinds of data. So if, if anything, these may be sort of lower bound estimates. If we were looking across the, a, a proper random sample of journals, we'd see more evidence. So, um, to paraphrase uh, Oscar Wilde, um, are the, the reports of the death of surveys uh, greatly exaggerated? Uh, I think they are. Um, we've seen in, in the data that I've just shown you that there's, there's no real evidence of any decline in the uh, rate of surveys being used in this kind of set of published journals, despite those caveats that I just gave. Here's another chart. Um, from uh, some work that I've been doing on opinion polls and so on. This is the frequency of opinion polls uh, in, the, in Great Britain since 1940. Um, each dot uh, represents more than, one, is that like, uh, more than one poll. But you can see the key thing here is there's an enormous increase in 2001 and onwards. This end, if, we, if we carried this on end of 2015, carried on to 2017, we'd see the same effect. First YouGov poll was published in 2001. So we are doing lots and lots and so I think we're probably doing many more surveys, different kinds of surveys, but doing many more surveys uh, than we did in the past. Here are some, some numbers to go with that. Uh, between 1945 and 2010, there were three and a half thousand published polls on, on who's going to win the election. Between 2010 and 2015, nearly 2,000. So we're seeing a real kind of huge increase in the rate of, of surveying of people. Here's another way we can see this global spend on online research in, in market research. Again, not quite the same thing, um, but you know, up to 20, 2014, seeing this, this huge and growing uh, increase in online research. That's the, the direction of travel. So the future, uh, as I see it, and this is sort of sl slightly uh, a um, plug for our next speakers, um, the, 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 the survey future will be about doing uh, lower cost online surveys. It means that we won't be doing fewer surveys, we'll be doing more, um, less costly surveys, different kinds of surveys. Why, why is that? Well, I mean, one of the key things here, I think, is that population inference is still really key to an enormous amount of, uh, of social science. 
And by that I mean we need to make inferences to the whole population. It's not okay to make inferences just to the people who are on Twitter or on Facebook, uh, to some undefined um, pool of respondents in a YouGov signed up panel and so on. So there are real uh, problems with moving away from the model of having samples of, uh, of a well-defined target population. So I think that, that is going to be a persistent issue which will mean this remains true. As I said at the start, I've, I've got a bit of a, a, a thick bugbear about, I don't really see, I hear a lot of talk about big data, um, but I rarely see a decent social science paper which addresses an interesting social science question that uses big data. So I'm very happy for people to challenge me on that, but I think that's another reason why we're going to carry on doing surveys, because being able to design uh, questions that address your, your, you know, your, your hypotheses and so on um, remains a, uh, uh, you know, a, a key benefit of surveys. We will see surveys changing. We'll have shorter questionnaires, um, probably more frequent time intervals. People are, you know, rather than sort of in interviewing every year, uh, as you do in the sort of standard repeated cross-section model, you'll see uh, more regular intervals. Um, device agnostic questionnaires, so you can answer a short questionnaire on your smartphone. Maybe, maybe a, question, a questionnaire that only asks one question. You know, or maybe a questionnaire which asks you five questions throughout the day. How are you feeling now? How are you feeling now? How are you feeling now? Um, and so on. So that we, it, when, once we're doing surveys in that way, it opens up all sorts of new possibilities. We don't have to do a 45 minute interview. We do a 10 second interview, ask people to take pictures, so on. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll potentially see um, this kind of more passive data collection, as I said, you know, rather than doing the national travel survey and trying to uh, ask people how long does it take you to get to the nearest bus stop, you know, you just either look at that on a map, don't bother asking the question in the first place, if you want to know where people are actually travelling, get them to agree to turn on their GPS and, and collect that data, connect to get their, their, their Facebook feeds and so on. Big problems with that. I'm going to finish very quickly on, on an example of this, um, which is where I think you know, there's, there's reasons to be cheerful for the future of even you know, the random survey. This is my own experience of working with the Wellcome Trust on a survey of young people. Wellcome Trust is interested in you know, people's, young people's views of science, whether they want to be a scientist, get a, a kind of a study science at university, that sort of thing. So, for the first two waves of this survey, uh, they spent an enormous amount of money doing it in the kind of the standard way. So it was, it was part of a, of a survey of adults, and that was a survey of the standard, you know, face-to-face, -face random probability thing with a cappy interview, very expensive, very slow. Um, in, this, in this adult sample, of course, if, if I was in this sample, my, my daughter would be eligible, she's 15, so they could just interview her to be part of a, a random sample of children, but there are not many in, in, in a sample of, of this size. So they had to do this additional screener uh, on adjacent houses next door, very complicated, uh, error prone. What they ended up with was a sample of, of about 450 kids aged 14 to 18. Response rate about 50%, really expensive, and let's face it, not much use to anyone. That's why no one ever analysed it. Okay? Um, so, in the, the most recent wave, we thought about doing this differently, and actually with, with uh, Kantar, um, who should take the, the credit for, 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 uh, for this, not me, um, but totally different design. The sample was drawn from the National Pupil Database rather than as being done as the uh, sort of post, post office address file sample. Um, that meant that we had the, their name, so we could send a letter directly to this young person. Um, asking them in a postcard, go online, here's the URL and a password, do this short interesting questionnaire and we'll give you a tenner if you do it. Lo and behold, the, we, we were hoping that we would get a response rate of about 20 odd percent for this. We ended up with a response rate of 50 percent within about three weeks. And because of the lower cost of doing this, 
we were able to get 4,000 achieved interviews. 25% of the kids, the young people, um, completed the uh, questionnaire using a smartphone or a, a, a tablet. Okay, so now this is a really useful, this is informed policy, uh, there's been a recent initiative about uh, ethnic minority kids in London and STEM and all this, kind of, it's been a really useful study and part of that is because these are digital natives they're, they're, and this is maybe, maybe the future um, holds out the, this kind of promise um, rather than the sort of apocalypse that I think a lot of us in survey research when, when all this started happening uh, once feared.